Well, Merry Christmas. Um, I think we should just say it like that. How about that? But however you say it, Christmas is amazing. I, I mean, we shouldn't overlook that. I heard a statistic this week, which makes me just know that Christmas is amazing. Did you realize that in the middle of all the politics and the crap going on in the news, the Hallmark Channel, the Hallmark Movie Channel beat CNN this week. I mean, people are into Christmas, obviously, and maybe escaping into Christmas. But, but here's the thing. It's like it, it gets pretty complicated, but I don't want you to forget. And I've been thinking about that this week. Like, do you realize we're part of something that not hundreds of people, not hundreds of thousands of people, but hundreds of millions of people this week, and perhaps over a billion people, are celebrating this. They're celebrating the birth of a baby in a little Israeli town thousands of years ago, probably 2,100 years ago. I mean, think about that, like of all those people, and we're all celebrating because of this. Matthew 121 says this, it says, and she will have a son, Mary will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Like there's hundreds of millions of people this morning even, remembering that God came to earth in a bod. See, I rhymed there. And came so that we could be freed from our sins. Not from breaking the rules, but actually the results of our past, present, and future sins and that's amazing. Now, you might think, well, I, you can trust me on the fact there's over hundreds of millions of people celebrating Christmas, but there are a lot of other people celebrating Christmas, and quite frankly, they're not celebrating this directly. In fact, they don't know this, but I want to tell you, I think there's still only one Christmas because this guy. There's really only one Christmas story because St. Nicholas, who came 270 years after the birth of this guy, of Jesus in the manger that we're celebrating this morning, 270 years later, there was a very, very wealthy man who converted to this thing in the, the country of Turkey, who converted to this thing called Christianity, which was the worship of baby Jesus who grew up, who died, who was resurrected from the dead and then ascended into the heavens, and people gave their lives, you know, gave their lives to to torture and murder to say we saw him after you said he was dead for three days and so this guy named Nicholas believed that story so much that he converted that he traveled to Jerusalem he learned theology he learned about this Jesus and he went back and he said you know what Jesus was the most radically generous person on the planet and loved children more than anyone else before or after. And so what he turned that into is he thought, well, then I should do the same. And so we get this guy who was Bishop Nicholas, who we know as Saint Nicholas, who was so amazing at sharing the wealth that he had with children and people in need that they sort of made a whole holiday about him. Years later, we trace all of our Santa, and it gets really crowded, right? Like, there's so many characters, but they all started from, like, a simple little baby in a manger with shepherds, and you know what? I'm not even mad that we put the, uh, <laughs> the wise men, or I call them magi, and some people have been telling them magi. I, I, I don't know. I'm from Missouri. We say things weird and wrong. Like, I say roof. I don't say roof. I say roof, so I, I get that, but, but I'm not even mad that they're here even though they're not in the scripture at the manger scenes because it's just amazing to look at this, this story and realize that all of this, all of the stuff that is Christmas, and we go, well, that's commercial, or that's secular now, or that's, but, but, but just think about this. Like, you can't escape Christmas, not just in America, but around most of the world, not all of the world, but around most of the world, you can't escape this thing called Christmas, Christ math, and it, mass, and it all started from this simple, simple story. Now, maybe it's got a little out of hand. Ho, 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 now I have a machine gun. I get that. 
But I want you to remember this as we talk today, like all of the characters, even the holiday armadillo, all of the characters sort of relate back to a character before them, right? So Santa, we, we said, well, how can Saint Nick deliver the presents? Well, he needed elves to make the presents and he needed reindeer to fly him from the North Pole and then we needed Rudolph to guide his sleigh at night and these stories are written and then we need the holiday armadillo to, to represent him in the southern states, I guess because there's no snow, I don't know, or they don't have chimneys. I don't know how that works exactly, we should investigate, but... I mean, all of these stories sort of go back to helping the other story. Um, so I thought this year, and, and I'm just really fascinated with the story of the wise men, because they're different than that. Like, every one of these stories sort of relate back to, you know, why does John McClane show up at Nakatomi Towers? He needs to save the Christmas party. And all of them sort of relate back to Christmas to this, but... These wise men are a completely different kind of story because they show up very early before Jesus is anything but a baby or a toddler. And they're included in this story, but they don't do anything that we can think would help. But, but I think that's not true. And so I want to share with you just a little further into the story of the Magi, of the wise men. Now, there's something you have to realize right up front is... And, and this is a huge criticism that some people have of the Bible. There's four Gospels. There's four good newses of Jesus, four accounts of the life of Jesus, and they are all sort of different. There's the same stories are repeated in them, the same accounts, I'll call them, because I don't think they're just stories, but they're different, and to me, I think that's a very, very good sign. When I read that, I get, I get really nervous today when I hear, have you ever done that? You can switch like, Nobody watches the news anymore, but like if you, you can hear the same talking points in our world, like not just from politicians, but from corporations, it's sort of like if you hear these same talking points, you go, hmm, somebody planned that, you know? Like it's, it, it doesn't seem to be a coincidence that I, you know, I kind of switch websites or I switch news channels and they're all saying the same thing, like someone's putting that out. There's a PR firm behind that. And, and so that is not what we find in the Gospels at all. We find four different writers telling the story about Jesus, and they tell the story not in a way that conflicts, but in a way that is very different. In fact, like Matthew, the one we've been talking about a lot that gives the story of the wise men, he starts with sort of the family tree of Jesus. So if you start in the New Testament and you go, I'm going to read the Christmas story, like, I guess the first part is just reading a list of names, like these are Jesus' ancestors. And then he goes straight to the birth of Jesus, and then the wise men show up, no shepherds at all, and then Mark, Mark starts the story completely different. Mark starts the story with John the Baptist, who's Jesus' cousin, who is the prophet that comes before Jesus and the one who baptized Jesus. So it's sort of weird that it starts more with the birth of John the Baptist. There's no manger scene. There's no Christmas, first Christmas at all in the book of Mark. No wise men, no shepherds, and it just gets into, it basically like there's a paragraph and a half of Jesus meeting John being baptized and then he just gets busy with his ministry and healing people and doing miracles. Uh, Luke, Luke is the one we read a lot. Luke is the one that the Peanuts characters read. It's, it's a beautiful story because it's written by a physician who went back later and you know he said like, I wanna make the most comprehensive story. And so he interviewed people. We think he interviewed Peter. We, we know that he interviewed a lot of people that were there. Um, so there you get the birth of John the Baptist. That's included. It ties into Mary actually hanging out with, you know, John the Baptist's mother, how that story came about. There's a musical interlude in there. Like it, 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 she sings a song. I mean, it's very involved. We have the manger scene. We have the angels showing up in the fields and we have the shepherds, but oddly enough, no wise men at all. The wise men aren't even included because they weren't there in that original part. Um, and then John... John tells the story of Jesus, but he does it completely different. It's no birth. There's no first Christmas. He's just like, in the beginning was the word. He ties Jesus back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Basically, he's saying the word of God spoke this planet into existence. 
And Jesus was there and was part of that plan from the beginning. Um, John the Baptist, Jesus baptized, there's none of the sort of nativity set Christmas in that. Now, what I want to tell you this morning is a story of the Magi, of these guys. Um, and I will say it's a plausible story. This is not like, I, I, and you have to, you should do this every week, not just this week. But you should think about this. And if you have questions, you should read about this. But this is, I believe, to the best of my ability, a plausible story of how these guys came along because they're a mystery. They're a mystery. They're mentioned in the one area. And it's just sort of confusing with what we know about them, where they came from and who they were. And so I thought we'd start with reading all that we have about these guys. We'll read that again. And then I want to tell you a story that I believe at least could be true about these guys. And you may know about the story of the holiday armadillo, but you probably haven't heard this story. Um, this is from Matthew, and this is what we know. So let's just read that. Uh, it's up on your screen. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. During the reign of King Herod, I say this every week, but you should realize he's giving specifics, like this is when it happened and this is where it happened, and he's writing to people who would know. So this is not once upon a time in a land far away. It says, about that time, some wise men <coughs> from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, King Herod, who was the king at the time, was deeply disturbed when he heard this. You know, he's not excited about the newborn king of the Jews. And, and I want you to notice, and this is so important, like think about this. They went to the palace and said, we'd like to meet the newborn king of the Jews, but they weren't like, and I'm sure you have him in the nursery. Like, can we at least watch him on the baby monitor? They weren't there because they thought the newborn king of the Jews was born to Herod. They knew it was someone else, which is what upset him. And so he called a meeting of the leading priests and the teachers of religious law and said, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? And oddly enough, they knew because there were prophecies. In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, or a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. And after this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. And it went ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And they entered the house. They're at a house now. They're not at the, at the uh, stable. And saw the child with his mother. We don't know how old, but probably not a baby. And they bowed down and they worshiped him and they opened their treasure chests and they gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So here's what we know. Here's what we know for sure. We know that the Magi were respected um, sort of influential guys. How do we know that? We know because they stopped and asked directions at the palace, right? Like you or I don't get the opportunity to, you know, go into a new country. They were not from that country and just go, hey, we'll stop by the palace and they'll receive us and answer all of our questions. So we know they were dignitaries. When they showed up with their entourage, with their, you know, with their wealth and with their you know, reputations like they were accepted into the palace. So we know they were super respected. They were wealthy because we know the gifts they brought. Um, scripture says they're from the east, which is pretty vague. Um, a lot of myth and early, early writings about them say they were from Persia. Um, <coughs> so they're Iranian, according to, to what we have. Um, we know there were astronomers slash astrologers like we go. There are astronomers who work at the, you know, National Observatory. And then there are astronomers who write some sort of, you know, cheesy horoscope on the, you know, like on the back of a napkin, like at, on a website somewhere. Like, and we think of those things being very different, uh, and they are. But, but in those days, not so much because they had the ability to observe the stars and Probably the planets, one thing about the stars, we don't know, it was a light in the sky, basically, is what it says. Um, so these are guys who are 
the scientists of the day, they're looking into the heavens, they're observing the movements of the stars, and they're tying them into the events that happen. Um, and one thing we do know about astronomy, not astrology, but astronomy today, large movements of, you know, the, the star map change because the earth is moving, and they might not have known that, but they knew the sky was changing, and they knew that something new had happened. Um, we also know they were familiar with Jewish prophecy because they came looking for the newborn king of the Jews. So they had, even though they weren't Jewish, they had followed prophecy somehow. And they were really motivated to meet this king of the Jews, right? Like, don't overlook that. I was thinking about that. Like, that's not a normal thing to do, right? Like, it, just because another country that you're not involved with, if they were from the East or from Persia or even China, some people have said, but let's say they're from Persia. Like, it's not like every time a new baby is born to a foreign country, you go and you worship him. That's just not the way it works. You know, I know the... You know, the British press might worship the newborn king of England, but they're not, we don't necessarily make a trip over to worship the newborn child. And that, that was a very unusual. So we know that there's something beyond just their paying respect to a king. All right, so that's what we know. That's, maybe we know a little bit more, but that's all I know. Um, more stuff that we don't know, actually. I was thinking about this, like, we don't know how many magi there were. We're... We think, we say three because there were three gifts, but there could have been, you know, 13. We have no idea. We don't know where they're from. We don't know what they saw in the sky. Like, we say star, and you have a star on top of your Christmas tree because of this. And, and you know, you go up to Allentown, Bethlehem area, and they're going to have the Moravian stars everywhere. And we go, well, that was the star. But truthfully, what they saw, what the Scripture says, and what we know is with very low power, you know, optics, they see a, a light in the sky, a new light in the sky. In fact, there's some, <laughs> and I'm so unqualified to talk about this, so I'm not going to make a big deal of it, but, but there's a lot of astronomy that goes back and goes, well, what happened 2,000 plus years ago? And they go, oh, well, the, this planet would have come into view for the first time in a thousand years at that time, and you would see a new light in the sky. That could have been the star that they saw and said, this must pretend the newborn king, and I'll tell you in a minute why I think they were looking for a newborn king. But we don't know. We really don't know. And it says that they saw the star and they followed it, but it doesn't necessarily say it was like moving ahead of them because it's not there when they go visit with Herod. And also think about this, if it was like this moving thing, like it was the cursor on the GPS and they're just following it on their camels, you know, it's like, why did they stop and ask for direction? The truth is they didn't know exactly where to go. Um, and then it says it reappears, so this light that they, that's the same star, they think, and so they follow it and it somehow stops right over the house. We don't know, and that's quite possible. I'm not doubting that it happened because God, we find in the Old Testament, you know, led the children of Israel through the desert with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. So God can do whatever he wants. I'm not doubting that at all, but we don't know exactly what they saw is what I'm saying. Like it was a light. Don't know if it's the same light from before, but they felt like, oh, the star's back. And then the big question is, you know, why, why talk to Herod? Like you're there because you're looking for the newborn king of Jews. Maybe it's just a natural thing because they're royalty or they're, they're powerful, influential people. So you stop at the palace and ask directions. But it, it's weird to kind of go, they triggered this genocide, which if you want to be even weirder, was predicted by a prophet 400 and some years before um, by involving Herod. So there's just so many things we don't know. Now, here's what we do know, and I want to read this to you. And once again, this is a, a plausible story, I think, but this is not something I've read a novel about or not something, this is just something that I, I think and that scripture might support and you decide, but it's a pretty interesting thought. Um, <coughs> there's a writing in the prophet Daniel um, that uses the exact same word the exact same word that they use to describe this guy. Um, magi. Magi? <laughs> I don't know. Like, I went to saw a magician. It doesn't seem right the way I'm saying it now that everyone's pointed that out, but I, I can't stop. So it's the same word. It's the same word that we find Matthew wrote when he described these guys from out of town. Um, 
And I want to read this to you, and then I want to tell you a possible backstory. So it says, one night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, who is king of Babylon, and once again, not a, not a fictional character. This is a history character. This is a, a guy you find in ancient history, not in just Bible talk. Um, one night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. And he called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and the word that they use for these guys, his advisors, is magi. Same exact word that we find in the New Testament. And he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. And as they stood before the king... He said, I have a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, long live the king, tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I'm serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, um, eh, you will be torn limb from limb, and your house will be turned into heaps of rubble. Now, he runs a tight ship, clearly, right? <laughs> like, not even you're fired. Like, this, this... But he makes a good point, right? Like, he, he, Nebuchadnezzar is no dummy. He runs most of the known world at that time. And he's like, if I tell you the dream, you're clearly going to give me a, uh, you know, <laughs> you're going to interpret it, right? That's what you do. What I need you to do is tell me what the dream was that I had that you don't know, and then interpret it. If not, I'll kill all of you. So, you know, sounds reasonable, but that's, that's what he said. So we'll skip ahead a little bit because there's much to read and I don't, I don't want to bog down too much. But it says, so once again, he said, they said again, please, your majesty, tell us a dream and we'll tell you what it means. And the king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time. And they're like, yes, we are. You're stalling for time because, um, you know, I'm serious about what I say. If you don't tell me the dream, you are doomed. If you know anything about Nebuchadnezzar, if you read anything about him or listened to, I love listening to history podcasts, like, Let's just say he wasn't joking about the part that he would. It was an exaggeration. He was like, I will kill you. I will wipe out your family. And then, like, you know, the mob might do that. But he's like, and by the way, then I'm going to bulldoze your house and leave it that way so people remember. He said, if you don't tell me the dream, you're doomed. So you've conspired to tell me lies, hoping I will change my mind. But tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. And the astrologers, or magi, replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great or powerful, has ever even asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer, or magi once again. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream. And they do not live here among people. And the king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the magi be executed. And because of the king's decree, Men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. Now, here's where Daniel shows up. Daniel is a young, uh, probably 20-something or younger young man who's been captured from his native land of Israel. He's been brought in as sort of a spoil of war. He is the smartest, the best. King sort of, you know, it wasn't like you would just capture computers back then or hard drives. He's like, I want to find the smartest people. Nebuchadnezzar was known for this. And that's why his, his, his empire grew so quickly. Is he would go in and take all the treasure and all the livestock and anything valuable, but he would also go, who's the smartest around here? He wouldn't kill the advisors of the king. He would bring them in and like try to learn from them. So he built this amazing empire by doing that. And so Daniel... And his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we find in another story in scripture, were brought in as sort of spoils of war. And so imagine like Daniel is this young man who's brought into this Magi group. He's one of the advisors. Wasn't invited to the meeting, I guess, because he was so young. Wasn't top tier. But imagine like how fortunate he was that he wasn't invited to the meeting, but when they couldn't, um, you know, tell the dream and interpret it, then he was killed. He was to be killed because he didn't do it. So, so sounds fair to me. But that's, now, now notice what happened next. We'll skip ahead again. So Daniel, <laughs> Daniel basically, when the guy comes to kill him and his friends, he's like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Like the king wants his dream interpreted and I haven't had a chance to talk to him. Let me talk to the t- king. And, and, and so the, the executioner who came to him and basically says, I'm here to kill you because you didn't interpret the dream or because the other magi failed. 
takes him to the king and he says this. Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, magi. It's funny, like, it's only used a few times in scripture and it's used a million times to describe these same guys or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. He agrees. He's like, guess what? Those guys are right. None of us can do. You're asking something impossible. And then he says, I love this, love this, love this. He says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has shown the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now, I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay in your bed. And then I want to read the dream, even though you go, what's a dream that happened, you know, 600 years before the birth of Christ? Why does that matter? Well, I'll tell you why in a second. I wish I could. My iPad just died here. Is it up on here? Oh, I'll try to get reconnected here in the meantime, but I'm going to read it right off here. Nope, sorry. Can you go back one, please? See, if I were a prophet, I'd be able to tell you what that says. But I don't know. But anyway, anyway, he said, um, he who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it's not because I am wiser than anyone else. He gives the credit to God that I know the secret of your dream. But because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. In your vision, your majesty. Now listen to this. This is what the king dreamed. I'm going to try it again. This is what the king dreamt. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. And it was a frightening sight. And the head of the statue was made of fine gold. And its chest and arms were silver. And its belly and thighs were bronze. And his legs were iron. And his feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. And as you watched, a rock was cut from the mountain, not by human hands. And it struck the feet of clay, smashing them to bits. And this meant something to a guy who had made a, you know, 40-foot tall statue of himself made of gold because he ruled the known world. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. You might go, oh, what a weird dream. Like, I wonder what he was smoking when he dreamed that. But here's the thing about that. What he, what he described was four empires. He described, like, the head of gold. Um, can we go back to that? The head of gold being Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, his empire. And he described the empire that would, be, that would come after that, Media Persia, which if you want to pop open your ancient history books, which I think now in college ancient history goes back to like the 70s or something. But like if you pop it open and it's not talking about early reruns of the Brady Bunch, I mean, it's like that happened. Media Persia came next and then there was a, another empire that followed. And we call it Greece. The Grecian Empire followed after that. And then, 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 there was another empire, a divided empire, just like Daniel sort of, he didn't predict because he was reciting the king's dream, which he said came from God. And so I don't want to say he predicted, but he said there's going to be another kingdom to come that's divided, but it's super strong. It's made of iron. And then it has like feet of iron mixed with clay like super strong and super weak all at once and it's not going to last because it's going to be smashed and that's the that's the Roman Empire now I'd love to pop this back up let's let's go into the next slide here um but I want you to notice what happened next and this is this is where our story takes a turn it says the king said to Daniel truly your God is the greatest of gods the Lord over kings a revealer of mysteries for you have been able to reveal the secret. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. And he made Daniel ruler over the whole providence of Babylon. So he becomes a ruler, a cabinet member. And then notice what it says, as well as chief over all his wise men. And at Daniel's request, the king appointed his friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs in the province of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. Um, see, Daniel, this, this Jewish refugee, he was taken as a spoil of war, was in charge of not just Babylon, but the Magi. So imagine this, he's in charge of the Magi. He saved the Magi. Like, I, I think they would listen to him. Like, he's the guy who interpreted the dream that saved our life. 
He's the guy who interpreted the dream, saved our life, and, and, and he seems to know something we don't know because like, we maybe could have made an interpretation of the dream, but he actually um, told the king what he dreamed. And so I, I just want just to maybe like just throw this out there like what if, if we can bring up the next slide. What if for 600 years, and you go, well, how would something carry on with 600 years? Well, I'll tell you why it would carry on, because this was not like you went to college to become a magi. It was something that was, we do know, was to be an astronomer, to be a, a, a you know, one of this class of people, the intelligentsia. It wasn't like they went away to school. They, they learned from their ancestors, from their father, from their grandfather, from their great-grandfather. It was all passed down, hand-to-hand, mouth-to-mouth. And so what if... What if they remembered Daniel? What if they remembered the teachings of Daniel and the, the, the prophet from Israel? And what if because of that, they were watching and they were like, Daniel predicted, because Daniel went on in that prophecy to say, these are the upcoming empires that are gonna rise after you, Nebuchadnezzar. And if you think about it, you know what's so crazy about that? Like over 600 years, they could have seen history unfold they could have like sort of checked the box like oh this is the silver empire oh my goodness the the medio persians and then actually we find that if the magi in matthew's story came from persia it would be because persia came in and conquered babylon we find in the end of daniel and took the magi out we think and know that happened from scripture and from history And so what if consequently, because they're kind of ticking through history going, oh, that happened, and Daniel predicted that, and they're remembering the stories of their ancestors who told them, like, there was a guy named Daniel, and he saved all of our lives, and you should listen to him, and here's what he predicted, and they sort of go through history going, oh, when Rome came about, when Rome conquered the Grecian Empire, they didn't go, oh, this is a surprise, like, oh, this is the Iron Empire, and what if they just kept searching for signs? of the thing that was to come. And they were watching the heavens, and so when they saw this new star, or maybe it was a planet, and it doesn't change the story from the Bible at all because they saw this light in the sky and God placed it there at exactly the same time, whether it was some magical like angel that appeared to them or God planned you know, millennia in the past that it would show up just at exactly the right time, which God can do because he's God. When that came up, they're like, oh, this is the sign of Daniel's prophecy. And in fact, I just want to read this because this is the end of Daniel's prophecy. And I want to see if if you're a Christian, this should sound really familiar, even though it's ancient Judaism. It says, during the reigns of those kings, when the giant rock comes down and smashes the statue, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And it will never be conquered. And it will crush all of these kingdoms into nothingness. And it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushed to pieces the statue of iron and bronze and clay and silver and gold. And the great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. This dream is true and its meaning is certain. So what if that's what the Magi were looking for when they showed up? in Bethlehem. Now what they found was a baby. And I want the band to come back up here. And and here's the thing. We know something. (laughs) We know something they didn't know. Like, we know here in York, Pennsylvania, North York, um, we know that after Babylon, there was a new Empire. There was a new empire that came along the Medo Persians that crushed Babylon and, and took the Magi with them. And we know after that the Grecian Empire rose. And we also know after that that the Roman Empire rose and it was the empire of iron and it conquered the whole world. But in the end, its ten toes were weak and it fell. And I like to show this picture at Christmas because it's a picture of Rome today. And I want you to notice something we know that they don't know. If you look at all of those crosses on the top of the buildings, they're not T's. 
<laughs> they're, they're, they're the sign that we use to remember that kingdom that cannot be destroyed, that kingdom that conquered Rome. I mean, that's Rome. They put crosses on top of their buildings to remember this baby that was born and died, who was executed by Rome, actually, and rose again. And so I want to tell you more next week about what the Magi found. We're going to have some fun, and uh, we're going to gather the kids in here, and we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And just a little preview. Now, this doesn't sort of not on the level of the birth of Jesus, but I've got even more... Um, yumminess that I'm going to add to my hot chocolate recipe. If you've ever had the Christmas hot chocolate, there's going to be half and half involved this year. So I just want to... <laughs> keto friendly. Um, not on the level of birth of Jesus, but we're going to have some fun. But, but, but. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It blows our mind to imagine a story like that. Now, we don't know if that's the story of the Magi, but we do know that all of those things happen. <laughs> and we know that those crosses are on the, on the roofs of the, of the capital of the Roman Empire. And if you believe the rest of it, as I do, you believe this kingdom hasn't even started to get going, even though it's conquered the world because that same Jesus is coming back and it will set all of this right. And so I want to pray with you. Dear Lord, we are so, so grateful for the birth of Jesus. God, we don't claim to fully understand your plan because it is too marvelous for us as humans. But God, I am just blown away to imagine the care and sort of the, 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 just the mastery of time and space and people and all the things that we can't control that you had to bring your son. And God, we want to have proper gratitude for that. So thank you for Jesus. And God, I pray that those of us here today just take a fresh look at how very, very, very important that is and that we would accept the gift that he brought with him, salvation. In your name we pray, amen.